Begin by going over this, which is just our our uh, seminar for week four. And somebody pointed out that I have on Moodle uh, assignment five to turn in um, for seminaring, and we're not going to do five. We're just going to do four. This, uh, this year. So this is actually the last week we'll be doing any seminar and the book is finished and now we're going to do some control stuff in this class. So, well, not today. We're going to seminar and we're going to do project stuff. The next, next week we'll start with the controls lectures, which will be fun. I, I like that part. Yeah. You said there's going to be quizzes due Friday. Is that like this Friday or next um, Friday? I think I'm going to change that to Wednesdays. I think it makes more sense on Wednesdays. So I think I'll make those two. Yeah, I'll probably make them do it at midnight. <laughs> All of us at 2 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. You guys are sitting in here working on the quizzes. On the whiteboard? Yes. Yes, that would happen. <laughs> yeah. So that's just generally what's going to happen. So yeah, this is the last week for the seminar. I'm a little bit distressed to see so few of us here today. I guess there are four, seven, ten of us. It means that four of us are missing. Previously, I know I know why Ryan's gone, so he, his is excused, but I don't know why other people are gone. No, that would be some kind of... He didn't tell his team why he's gone. It's a personal thing. It's, it's, it's not... Yeah, it's not like... Yeah, it's not like a, it's a, whatever. He's okay, I'll tell you that. He's okay, and I, uh, I'm i sure he'll fill you in on the details, but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, what did you guys think of these last, how many chapters did we do? Four or five chapters? Five. Five? How, how would you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. Emergent stuff with the swarm thinking out was awesome. Yeah. So she's a, she's like a swarm robotics person. That's like her thing. So. That's why she enjoyed writing it so much. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's why it's like the end of the book where like oh all this other robotic stuff is down here and then we get to the last this chapter stuff. and the last structure. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, here's some different types of robots. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's kind of. The future of robotics is kind of. Uh, but, I'm actually. I didn't write any really notes on it. Yeah. What else will you write about? Yeah. No. I think it's. Uh, I mean, the future is. It's. It's hard to predict because we're in this kind of like this fermentation period where people are coming up with different ideas and. It's, it's hard to predict what's going to happen, but it's good to think about the types of applications we might be able to use them for. It, it, the, the process of developing technology is much less linear than we often present it to be. It's not always like we have a problem and so we choose to embark on this journey of trying to come up with the best solution to the problem and then we overcome any difficulties along the way, and then we have solved the problem. That, that's like how it works ideally, but most more often it's like, oh, we invented this thing, and it seems like it might have some applications. We kind of think it might have some application to this, and you know, people try it out for several things, it doesn't really work, and then somebody thinks, oh, you know what, I saw that you know, other technology that did something really similar, didn't really have a good application, but this would be a great application for that, and then it turns into a thing. So, the development of technology is very messy. Just push a button, and technology pops out. Technology pops out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we need a technology button. Um, I, I did give us a warm-up video for today. I thought it was I thought it was fun. You guys may have already seen this, but I think it's hilarious. Did it. <laughs>
<laughs> Made a lipstick robot. That's worth a replay. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys do you guys know her? So it's Simone Gertz. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Yeah, the shitty robot nation. Uh, she's pretty hilarious. Like her YouTube channel is pretty good. She did a lecture on the face. Popcorn helmet. I haven't seen that. It beats down popcorn. It has little hands in the front. Shuttles around. I haven't seen that one. That sounds good. Yeah. No, well, that was like her, basically her interview robot with Adam Savage. Oh, really? Joint contestant. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah, she, yeah, she's pretty, she's pretty cool. She's a sort of robotics educator, sort of popularizer, YouTube personality. I don't know. I don't know how to. I don't know how to put her in a box. So I'll just let her re remain unboxed. So let's talk about emergent behavior, which we've talked about a little bit, but now you guys actually got to read the chapter on it. Um, I just wrote a couple notes about it. Um, she got a little bit more formal in the way that she she defined it because on first pass you might say something like it's a robotic behavior that you wouldn't expect, but expectations are really hard to describe. It's really not. It's a very uh, fuzzy concept, uh, and once you've seen something, then you expect it, right? So. Most technology nowadays does things that somebody 50 years ago wouldn't have expected. <laughs> so if they saw something today, they would say, oh, I didn't expect that. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that every technology is emergent, although I think there are some emergent characteristics to a lot of technologies that we don't acknowledge typically. But her, her uh, definition, I think, was pretty good. Um, this is my paraphrasing of it. Uh, emergent behavior is structured robot, be uh, robot behavior observed but not explicitly programmed into the controller. So if we don't explicitly program it in, it's emergent. Now explicitly programming something in um, means different things. So I think that my perspective on emergent behavior is that Emergence is there's some sort of spectrum of emergence, and even a lot of what we would think of as as uh, typical engineering designs uh, have some sorts of emergent behavior. I mean, sometimes the controller is really simple for a device, but it does something that's rather complex, and just based on looking at the controller, we wouldn't expect it to be able to behave that way. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is a like an advanced robot either. It could just be something really basic. So I I think it's a very it's a good concept to keep in mind, but it's not clearly defined, I think. It seems like anything that you were able to distill down to its bare roots of what it what it needed to, to be able to do the perform a task is what it tends to be. Because to me if they were like they talked about the wall following quite a bit, that it was realistically just obstacle avoidance. Well to follow a wall is really the only thing you needed to know. At the wall that you bumped into something and not to continue bumping into it, and then to have it not turn completely left or go away from the wall, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't need to know that there's a wall to follow. So, most of the things, if you can boil them down to what it absolutely needs to be able to sense and know, then isn't that the, the essence of what the emergent behavior is? I mean, that's like marketing almost. Oh, yes, it's emergent. Yeah. Basically, we were able to actually distill down what you wanted it to do, it needed to know, it needed to do. I, I think you're right. I, I think that criticisms of emergent behavior are valid, um, but I think that what the roboticists mean when they talk about emergence is, is that there's something that maybe we would have a really hard time distilling down into little simple rules, typically, and if we looked at those little simple rules, we wouldn't expect, once again we have that concept coming in, we wouldn't expect for this complex behavior to emerge and so it's almost like it's, it's almost like some form of, of uh, 
like an advanced design technique or something like being able to design for emergence. Um, I I think that when you try to make it super precise, it starts to break down. But it's worth going through that and breaking it down. But it's also worth recognizing that it is trying to kind of describe something that. Um, we see these things in nature, for instance, that we look at and we just say, wow, like how does such a simple creature do such complex things? And uh, the answer, we think, is that it really uses this sort of emergence, um, not consciously necessarily, but it, it's doing simple things, and from those simple things, something more complicated has emerged. And that's kind of what we mean by it. And, that, and this is actually what, there's this flocking, there's this flocking um, behavior, which you can actually create in a swarm of robots without super complex rules. Um, they're mostly just trying to stay the same distance apart from each other. That's like all they really know. And they flock. And it's kind of cool, but I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it's kind of what you'd expect, right? Like if they're just trying to keep the same distance apart, and they're trying to stay with each other. If you start one moving in one direction, then that other ones are going to try to get with it, and then they're all going to try to keep that same sort of distance. And the, the authors makes sense. used to really like the word unexpected, but I think a better term is just I think that they don't want to say unintended for a reason because they don't want – you want to be able to design for it. If it's intended, then it's not really emergent behavior. It's designed behavior. Uh, so that's what the definition is, is attempting to, to differentiate. So emergent – so if we, add, you know, if we believe this definition – uh, emergent means that if you look at the simple programming, um, then it is not explicitly stating to do a certain thing. So, for instance, these these robots are not specifically programmed to form a flock and to make sure that that their um, outer uh, uh, that their uh, I guess. Uh, their boundary, their outer boundary stays intact and that they all move in the same direction. That's, that's like not explicitly programmed in there, but they do it because of some other reason. The other reason is that they're trying to stay the same distance apart from each other. And then if you set one off in a direction, um, then they all flock that direction. And that, that sort of thing, or there was the other example that we did where um, I think I talked about it. I'm not sure I showed you it. But if you have uh, robots like this and you set up a bunch of like styrofoam cubes, there were some experiments that people did, um, set up a bunch of styrofoam cubes, and you just give them simple rules like uh, go forward um, until you're like stuck and then back up and turn a certain amount and then go forward until you're stuck. And if you have something on the left, then turn right and... That those sorts of like simple rules, and you set them loose in an arena. What they did was they they uh, bunched up all the cubes. The robots bunched up all the cubes. Pucks. Sorry. Pucks. Uh, well, I, that could be a different experiment. Yeah, it was, pucks. It was pucks. Okay, yeah, the, yeah. There's uh, there's a, another one that I'm thinking of that they used styrofoam cubes to do it. But it's the same idea. You can you can get this. Uh, behavior out of it, which is that they they uh, form these groups. They sort of clean everything up into little piles, which, if you were going to try to tell the robot to do explicitly, is probably pretty hard to do. Um, but instead, you wrote these really simple rules, and this behavior emerged. It is true that most of the time, this stuff is found accidentally. But the reason why the definition is not that you find it accidentally uh, is that there is this hope that maybe we can learn how to design these systems that have complex behavior by programming simple 
simple sorts of uh, of controllers on them. So that's the that's the goal of the sort of uh, talking about emergence in robotics is that we're one day going to be able to to make things happen like that. Like we're going to be able to design something that does something really complicated. But we just program really basic stuff into it and let it let it go. Um, so there's there's one, uh, and she does it. I don't think she talks about. It. I don't. I can't recall her talking about it at all. There's this there's this concept uh, called evolutionary design, and d did she talk about it at all? I can't recall her talking about it. Yeah. So it's really closely related to emergence. Is that, does somebody do their research on that topic? Okay, good. So I can just talk freely then. Ryan yeah, Ryan probably did. <laughs> uh, so the, the, one of the problems with the emergent design is that if you, put, if you make something with simple rules and you let it go and then you wait to see something emerge, it's, it's really hard to design anything intentionally that way, right? If you want you're designed to perform a certain function, starting off with a group of simple rules and letting it go and seeing if your, if your behavior ever emerges is probably not the way, best way to go. It's probably not going to work. So what people started doing pretty recently is uh, evolving designs, mostly in simulation. What they do is they design something that has simple rules um, and they have a metric. So for each each um, uh, design iteration, you have, or, or yeah, we'll call it iteration. Each design iteration, um, you make a bunch of variations of it, random variations of it. So you tweak, like maybe it's like instead of turn left. 30 degrees when you see something on your right, it's like turn left 32 degrees when you see something on your right. And, somebody, and then another one is turn left 28 degrees and turn left whatever. And uh, those sorts of variations are simulated. And you have some metric, like for instance, they do this for uh, soft robots to see which one performs the best in locomotion. So they'll have like really simple designs uh, or really simple um, atoms or, or parts, sort of base parts of these soft robots. And one of them will be a, contract, a contraction part. Another one will be an, uh, um, uh, a structural part that's stiff. Another one is going to be a soft part that's not actuated. And they just randomly uh, mutate the configuration. So you have like three cubes and four cubes and you can arrange them different ways and they can contract and and your metric is you want it to move across the screen you want it to locomote um, and you can you can have random randomly generated versions of this iterations of this te you test it based on the metric like in five seconds how far did it move which one moved the furthest Okay, we'll use that one, then we'll randomly mutate that one into a bunch of different possibilities. So it's like they're trying to do essentially what evolution does, which is iterate on itself randomly, and the best thing survives, and then, or I don't know, best in the sense of survival survives, and then it continues to be passed on, that, that trait. And so these are, these are um, some methods that are used to guide that process of design towards a certain solution. So you could say, okay, simple machine, simple rules with variations. Let's try a bunch of variations and see which ones give us the best results. Obviously, this works best in simulations. So you can try a bunch of different things. Is that yeah. part of like what they rule for the unsupervised versus supervised uh, learning stuff? Yeah, that's more of a learning algorithm, um, but it's it's not uh, it, it's related in the sense that it's able to 
it's able to learn based on performance, which is the same as evolutionary design, um, um, in which you you have the best design move forward. Um, so that's yeah. I mean, it's related. It's not um, the same algorithms and whatnot that they're using, but it's the same idea. And that's what I mean. That's what learning and evolution are very closely coupled ideas, and so they they cross pollinate a lot in our sort of artificial um, systems that we create to reproduce that sort of stuff. And that's I mean these are really open research things. So you know we evolutionary design and uh, uh, neural network learning and that sort of stuff is you know it's still a very immature these are very immature technologies and you know they may end up coming together at some point moving forward together uh, it's really not clear so we'll see and that's part of what you know so I actually have as the, the last section so the you know future of robotics I just have it blank because that's for you, for you guys to write. Okay, that's for you guys to write. What is the future of robotics? Um, yeah. So yeah. So sometimes it's, it's important to know that emergent behavior is uh, can be expected or unexpected, uh, desirable or undesirable. So sometimes. Um, Things can go wrong, and you could almost look at some of the classic engineering uh, disaster examples as being emergence. Uh, so, for instance, I would say that Galloping Gertie, the classic example, is it's. I mean, it's such a classic example uh, for several reasons, but one of those is that this was something that they did when they designed this bridge. They didn't think it was going to do anything like that. It didn't. They, I mean, it was not something that they expected. So expectation comes in again there. But the, with the sort of simple system they thought they were building, they didn't expect this complex behavior out of it. So sometimes the simple system that you build that doesn't have these abilities you think uh, actually has them, and it emerges. And sometimes that's bad. Um, most of the time. It's benign, but sometimes it's really bad. Sometimes, and very occasionally, it's good. <laughs> very occasionally. Um, so then there was a chapter on navigation, which is another one of the sort of big, hot areas of robot research. Um, it's the process of a robot finding its way through its environment. There are several different aspects of navigation required of the robot. There's localization, which is figuring out where the robot is. Search, which is looking for something. Uh, path planning, which is planning its way to a goal. Coverage, is making sure a region uh, uh, of an environment is searched. And SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. And so uh, I'm actually going to show a little video of of, uh, of one of those vacuum robots, it, the SLAM system that it has, it shows like the internal model as the robot goes around. So it's pretty cool. I thought it was a neat little description of it. So a little bit more on localization. Uh, it uses a model of its environment and tries to figure out where it is in relation to that model. So if you're going to localize, you have to have some sort of internal representation uh, of the environment. Otherwise, there's no, there's nothing to localize yourself into. So your model has to be, uh, you have to have a model to place yourself into. Where it's like the here you are arrow or the, the red button or the red star on the, the mall map when you're looking for uh, zoomies or something in the mall. <laughs> Do you have a story you'd like to share? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So like a, a kid who's like lost and just like disoriented and just runs into something. Yeah, slam. 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 <laughs> 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 Has anybody ever seen anybody walk into a glass door before? Oh yeah. Hey, I don't know. I've been the guy. Saw something. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've never walked through a screen door. I have bumped into, a, luckily not slammed into or broken through a glass door, but I have hit one. Oh, I also I did I did walk into. You know how they have those those double doors that have the post in between them. But like they don't look, it's like a full like column or something. It's just like it's just the, to latch. It's just to put a post in there. Yeah. I find that to be a terrible design. Um, and I was talking to somebody beside me and you know, there's like people flowing on both sides of me and something that I'm not even thinking and just wham the side of my head into this pole. And it's there's nothing like running into a pole. That makes you feel really stupid. Um, Came right at me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just uh, really snuck up on me. But yeah, also I've tripped before um, in public. And was like biffed it <laughs> for no like wearing sandals and just like tripping on a flat surface. Just <laughs> then you you stand up and like people are around you. Unless they notice that you're okay, like, they all want to laugh, but they're all trying not to laugh. And, like, you're trying not to cry and run away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is pretty funny when that happens. Okay, so, um, it, it's hard to figure out where you are, uh, even if you have a really good map. Um... Because estimation is indirect, measurements are noisy, and they can be intermittent. Um, you can use odometry, for instance, which measures distance traveled from some reference point. But it has its limitations because you're going to accumulate error, right? So that's not great. Being able to check in to reference points is much better than measuring y your distance from a reference point. So, for instance, GPS does not work by getting getting a reference point and then deciding to measure how far you go from there for time thereafter. You're always checking back in. You're always checking back in to see, okay, where 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 to go? Where's the reference point? Where's the reference point? And that is uh, key to really good um, localization technologies. Um, there's a lot to it, but of course you can, you know, it's the same with um, uh, with knowing, f for instance, of you could know how many times your wheel has rotated uh, since you started, but the accuracy with which you can determine how far um, uh, you've gone based on that uh, diminishes at the further you go because the error that you have maybe you only have like a one percent error for each revolution well that is really bad if you've done like a thousand revolutions your accuracy is terrible so yeah okay search and planning or search and path planning so often these attempts to find an optimal path from the robot's current location to the goal uh, uses map discretization to allow graph search algorithms to find paths. So Google Maps is a good example of this. Um, I'm a, I am quite frankly think that we should be much more in awe of our ability to pull a device out of our pockets and get directions anywhere that are pretty solid except instantly. Except in this room. Except in this room. <laughs> no reception. No reception. What's cool though is that GPS GPS works without even having a data connection at all or a cell reception at all. So the GPS still works. You can't download the map data then. But if you already had the map data, like when I was over in Europe, one of the tricks that I used was I would 
you can download the Google Maps data for a certain region. And so I would just, when I was in Rome, I downloaded on Wi-Fi the data, and then I could navigate around the city without using any data. So that's pretty sweet. Recommend it. What? <laughs> so, Google Maps are often incorrect with one way roads, though. So oh, yeah. That was fun in France when we had a car for a long time. Oh, God. <laughs> now I was walking mostly. It's a lot better when you're walking. Going from city to city. So we'd walk in the cities, but finally we ended in, um, what's it? I wasn't bored, though. I think we ended in Paris, actually. And mm. It just wanted to kill us. That's all Google Maps wanted to do was to just like turn left. It's like one way. <laughs> yeah. It is it is tough. When you start to trust Google Maps too much. One time I was exiting off of I five and it and it was like turn left on this road and there's literally a a concrete wall there. It has never been a way you can go, um, but for whatever reason, Google Maps said that that's the way to go to Seattle U. And I was like, I don't, I don't remember that there's a that there's a way. But I, I thought Google Maps, you know, it, it won't give me a bad steer. It'll tell me to go there. I said, I think you take the other exit. No, uh, it told me, and and I got there, and I was I was like sailing past this 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 concrete wall as I'm looking at it, and I'm like. Kind of like going back and forth, and then it's like rerouting, and I was like, "Oh, okay, now, now you reroute me." <laughs> yeah, I haven't done that, but I have heard that that happens. I mean, it's good to probably if you're like a video gamer and you're always like looking at your like your your localization map while you're navigating. Um, that's a bad habit when you're driving. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't, I haven't been a gamer in a long time, but that was how I, a lot of times you would get around, is it's easier to navigate with the little map than it is with the visuals, so. <laughs> okay, so optimal paths require searching all possible paths, which is computationally expensive. So this is what AI, one of the big tasks that AI has worked on is path planning, okay? And a lot of the AI technologies that were developed are in things like Google Maps to try to help you get an optimal path from one, one point to another point. But um, the number of possible ways you could go are many. Many, many, many. Um, more than you can represent and compute in a, in a computer very quickly. And that has led to a lot of different algorithms for finding optimal paths from one point to another point. Um, and they're really interesting. It's, a, it's an entire topic, and I encourage you to look into it more, um, Do maybe do... I mean, you guys hopefully have already done your research papers, but uh, yeah, it's something that I think you should continue to study because it's really cool. AI stuff, optimization, they're very related. Also, optimal control theory, they're all sort of in the same uh, field, so really cool stuff. Um, sometimes uh, sometimes it's best to look for can parse that sentence at first. Sometimes it's best to look for local or non-optimal paths due to computational cost uh, of optimization. So if you don't want to uh, spend all day computing the best possible way, just come up with a way that's pretty good. That's usually the, the method that we use. So when Google Maps computes what the best path is for you to go from one point to another point, telling you quickly is usually pretty important. 
And so it may not return like the very, very best path, but it will probably return a pretty good path. And so it's not always the most optimal, but it's usually pretty close. Um, and that's what the algorithms do is they want you to they want to be able to trade off fidelity to the optimal with computation time and size of computation. Yeah, Google Maps will also offer alternate paths. It'll tell you like this is two minutes slower, but you'll like freeway Yeah. And if you take a wrong turn, it'll reroute to your current path. Right. Which which needs to happen pretty quickly, right? So when you're driving and you need it to calculate where you need to go, it can't sit there and come back five minutes later because you will not be the same place as you were when it started calculating. So it's got to do it within a few seconds, um, otherwise you're screwed. So. You know, if, you, if it tells you to do make an intern, you're really screwed up. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is true. Yeah, I learned this about Google Maps at least back five, no, seven years ago. I was driving, I was driving from Seattle down to Southern California and to Ventura, California, which is out, outside of LA. And it, it took me down on I-5 for a long ways. And then it was like, and then you take this hypotenuse of the triangle to Ventura. And I thought, great. I'm so glad that I had Google Maps to tell me that. I wouldn't have known if that was a good idea or not. So uh, I took it. And one of the things that Google Maps does is, it, is it's calculating based on speed limit what, how fast it'll take you to get somewhere. Well, turns out that this road had a speed limit of like 55 on a lot of it, 50 or 55 on a lot of those like mountain passes. Yeah, switch back, switch back. And, but like the, yeah, it, the actual speed you could go was like 20 because you were just going around a switchback and then going around a switchback and going and I was so frustrated with having gone that way. It, it told us it was going to be like an hour shorter or something and it was probably an hour longer uh, because of all of that. The view is really cool and then like we came into Ventura on this like really cool mountain road and it was beautiful but I was well, also, we at some point we felt like maybe we got lost and we weren't sure. It's like we had to stop at some gas station in the middle of nowhere, and it was just weird. Over the years, it's gotten a lot better. They're taking a lot more uh, consideration into density of traffic, and the more people that are using stuff like that, that they know how many how much traffic is on the roads. And my sister was in LA, and they had these start driving a lot of cars now through uh, residential, like where you normally wouldn't have gone through called cities, yeah. through residential areas. They're routing a lot of traffic using that of those other routes, even though it's the speed limit might only be 20 miles an hour. Yeah. Because you're going to avoid it sitting in traffic and it helps traffic flow. But it's, yeah, and it's creating kind of issues. I, so I, when I was going from just here to Seattle a couple of months back, I don't usually use the GPS, but I was sitting and it was an accident that had happened and it was like really slow. And so I, got on Google Maps and I and it was like take this exit and like go around a lot of this stuff on these residential roads and little country roads. I mean I literally went on a gravel road at one point. Like it was not even paved. And I I was driving by these houses that are, you know, they're not these roads aren't built for traffic to be going through on them. The, these people, these residents, are not going to like the fact that suddenly this became like the way to go, um, and I, I could see how that could really cause some issues with traffic control folks being like, "Hey, we don't want everybody driving through residential areas, like stream of cars going through here because we're going to run over kids or whatever." I don't know. Is that what you run over when you drive through residential areas? Like, I, it's hard to keep up with the time. <laughs> yeah, I've never actually stopped to check, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, and then slam. 
So it has to solve the data association problem. So multiple places in an environment may have similar features. So how is the robot to know where it actually is? Many SLAM systems exist, and here's an example. So I think this is pretty cool. And this will be the last thing we do, and we're going to go to that research talk. So this thing just goes and oh, it, it's hit something. So it put down some red blocks in those. Notice it's a grid, right? It's not trying to do a continuous map. It's just doing a grid. And it just goes back and forth and keeps, you know, it hits stuff and then puts a red block there. And wherever it's able to roam, it's yellow. Does it remember? Uh, I don't know about the specific one, but I think that's generally the idea, is that it remembers it so that it can go through it and do a, um, do, it can plan out then coverage of the space, because otherwise it's just roaming around, right? So this way it's able to know where it's been, know where it needs to go, and work it out. Yeah, no, it can't. <laughs> it, it just, it just can't. Uh, what does it mean when it turns green? You notice how it maps out stuff for a while in yellow and then turns green? Yeah, it so seems to mean that that there is a an enclosure around it that it's it's, it's only open on only open on one side. Yeah, so that it's there's probably a better way to describe that mathematically, but yeah. Anyway, it's like more of that, but pretty cool, huh? Uh, and so then it has a very rudimentary map after it's gone through the whole space, and then it can plan out how to how to go ahead and get a see like obviously there's a room in there that it can't go into, right? Um, in the center, it's just blank, um, and and so the you know, it, it's able then to map it out and say, okay, I want to cover all this space. Uh, what's the best way to travel around optimally to cover the entire space? And so that's like, um, it's related to like the traveling salesman problem where you have a bunch of cities you need to visit, um, may or may not require any, you know, priority with it, but may, it, Typically, there's no priority. You just have to cover all of them. How do you cover all of the cities with tra traveling the least distance? Um, so that's what it's trying to do is optimize its path. And so now it knows the whole map. So now it can say, okay, I'm going to start here and cover this room, and then I'll cover that room, and then I'll cover this room and come up with a plan. So pretty cool considering... It's a vacuum. It just picks up crap from the floor. So uh, we're going to come back and discuss a little bit more. And then, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Where is the meeting at? Uh, it, is, it is in the other building in 210. Two, yeah, 210. So we have a couple minutes. Uh, it's in.